Welcome to the Global Spin Podcast with me, Ryan Kramer, where we take a deep dive into the world of global selling and share the secrets to growing your brand in new markets. Whether you're looking to expand your brand, enter new markets, or boost your sales, we've got you covered. Tune in for unscripted, engaging episodes that will take you on a journey of discovery and success. Let's get started. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Ryan Kramer, and this is my corner of the internet. This is the Global Spin Podcast, where I bring the best and the brightest in the Amazon e-commerce and logistics space. You've made it. You've hit the right uh, play episode uh, for today. I'm super excited for you to be a part of this journey and to listen to our guest to help elevate your brand to a whole new level. That could be taking your business to a new marketplace. It could be taking it outside of where it currently is, and you're just looking for those those little tiny nuggets, right, of, of how to Im, uh, Im, power your brand to take another a step forward whether it be again in e-commerce or retail or even just trying to figure out what's going on in the in the space of uh amazon and e-commerce that's what this podcast is all about and uh the global spin podcast if you haven't been a guest or a friend of the show before is powered and fueled by frisbee frisbee is helping businesses take their business to a next level expanding brands internationally uh, with ease, whether it be shipping logistics and port of record or just tax and compliance, we have the experts who are helping brands take their business to another level. Just go ahead and check us out at frisbee.com. Again, that's frisbee.com, F R I S B I.com. It's on my hat. You can't forget it. Um, thanks again for everyone who, again, coming into uh, my corner of the internet. It's where I like to talk about what's going on in the space. Uh, I spent the last 15 minutes already looking at my clock, talking and catching up with our guest today uh we, we have a lot of fun in the space and as is everyone who gets involved in the amazon and e-commerce world knows is that there's a lot of great people when it comes to specific topics that you want to hear what's going on uh it could be about ppc and you go oh that's a destiny with sean a uh, question or amina uh amina question or uh and again these names all mean something to me because when they come up in my head I always know who to go to. And this is uh, this is one of those easy ones, I want to say, of when it comes to international or translations, international expansion, translations, something in the world of growing globally, this person always comes up to mind. So uh, I always wanted to uh, get her on for the longest time. She's been traveling the world, as one does in this space, uh, but she's now uh, hunkered down for, for the summer, if you will. I've, I've cornered her into my podcast, so I've been able to make sure that She's welcome back to the Global Spin Podcast, friend in real life, friend of the show and past podcast, um, but a uh, first time on the Global Spin Podcast. Welcome to the Global Spin Podcast, Yana of YLT Translations. Yana, thank you for uh, hopping on today. I appreciate uh, the time. I know you're a busy person, but thanks for coming on. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for the I've been waiting for you to invite me to come to your hey. podcast. So, uh, hey, you have an open you. invitation. You know that, too. <laughs> I've, I've made that clear for very select few people that... They are allowed to come on whenever. It, the podcast world's different, right? We always do this live, and I, I've been pumping these out like crazy. But um, certain people, uh, we were trying to do a lot of sellers at first, and I had to say no to a lot of people, which I hate doing. I'm not. I'm a big yes, I can do that person. But uh, hey, you've been busy too, so I'm glad we could find a time here. Recording this on a Monday. Um, thanks for tuning in and again coming on today. Sure, absolutely. I mean, my pleasure. And um, I was just like excited because it was like a really good timing prior to Prime Day and all of that. And it, I think it's just the right time for sellers and, you know, just brands, enterprises, whoever listens to the podcast to to get updated and to be follow the latest trends, try out some new things for their businesses when expanding globally, of course. Absolutely. And that's what both of our businesses are focused on. But for people who may not um, who know who you are or they're new to the space or they're just dipping their toes in international water waters, um, I should say, what's kind of like your backstory? I know we've talked previously uh, before, but for people, how did you get introduced to Amazon space and um, how did you start uh, YLT translations? Yeah, so um, I I used to work uh, in um, a, it was a startup uh, that was like nine or ten years ago, and then turned out to be a four hundred uh, person company, and I was their COO, and this is where I got familiar with everything e-commerce related, Amazon as well. Um, nobody wanted to deal with Amazon accounts at that point, like seven eight years ago, and then I was like, oh, I want to do it, and 
can I got really to enjoy it. I, this is the first time I heard about like buy box and, and stuff like that. Um, and um, I was running um, an international side of business for, for this company. And then uh, I kind of tried to play around with um, different international listings. So you see how we, we can make it better. I have a really big knowledge in Google and SEO. So uh, I was just trying to apply what I know um, on actual listings. Um, and um, this is how I got the idea to, start my own thing which is now wild Tea translations and now it's it's something that uh, our bread and butter is basically amazon seo so we make sure that your content is better than your competitors that you rank better than that your um, english listing translates not into a new listing but it translates into sales um, so that's basically our bread and butter uh, and creating new marketing copies of your product listing that's amazing. I, I, that's the first time I've heard you use the phrase Amazon SEO when describing yeah. Wild Tree Trends. Is that something new that you're 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 kind of pioneering and changing? It's not a directional change; it's just a definition, like enhancement, yeah. if you will, right? So I decided to start using that more and more because we work with a lot of very big brands and enterprises, and they not necessarily have an Amazon educated team or like an Amazon specific people that. Um, know what you say like product listing optimization that they know what it is but sure. when when you tell them like Amazon SEO they're like oh you mean keywords and I'm like yes exactly because everybody knows what SEO is but when you say Amazon SEO you make sure that you cover keywords and that you actually don't do like word by word translations or just like regular translations but when you actually create an optimized marketing copy that is going to rank well for a certain keyword that you think are relevant for the product. So I think Amazon SEO kind of uh, broadens that niche that the, the we are in to broader audience so that everyone understands in the e-commerce world what we are actually uh, doing. By definition, you are literally translating this to a bigger market, which is what you've you know, Amazon transla uh, translations or YLT translations has always been known for. So that's a fantastic kind of broadening and kind of making a business seem bigger. But it makes yeah. it, it it speaks to a lot more people, which is really cool and exciting. How how has that gone over? Have people been confused, or has it been exciting to kind of broaden that message a little bit more? I, I, I'm excited just hearing you talk. Yeah, about I mean, it it really depends who who you speak with. I think that you know, if I spoke to a, a private label Amazon seller, I would say Amazon SEO. They'll be like, okay, fine. But they would maybe like use the term such as like listening optimization or something mm -hmm. like that. But when I talk to someone and then I understand that they don't have a lot of knowledge, but I want them, I, I want to explain exactly what we do without, you know, going like uh, just like overboard with all these terms and this and this and blah, blah, making it sound like a rocket science. I just say like, oh, but we do, we don't do just translations. We also do um, SEO on Amazon. So we optimize the products. And they go like, oh, okay, I understand fully now what you do. Because sometimes I would catch myself into like overly explaining, trying to just kind of like put all these pieces together so I make people understand what we do. But I would actually confuse people that way. So I understood that like the 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 simpler way I could put it into like what we do would be better. And then if I use something that is kind of known to a wider audience, that would be a better way to explain to people that we do not only do regular word by word translations, but it's an SEO copy, which means you have also localization, you have keywords, you try to rank these products, you try to, you know, beat your competitors on the content level and all of that. So everyone that. understands SEO. Yeah, so you're, 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 yeah. Well, you're fighting the same fight that we are because for the longest time it was just, hey, it's just shipping right it was just it was literally yeah. <laughs> in our title of, of shipping but there's this other components behind the scenes and without boring people about what we do yeah. because i do that all the time is is there's just more to the problems that we do it's just like kind of tweaking things here and there it just makes it a lot easier for you to do it not a one and all solution but almost a there's more to it and you can't you can't explain it all in one nice little tagline it's you yeah. try to simplify it, but there's always more you can do, right? Uh, for for every exactly. service provider out there. Awesome, exciting times. You and your team are growing. Um, you're traveling around, uh, but we've titled for everyone who's who's uh, tuning in and watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, or you're listening to us on your favorite podcast station. Again, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. You know, you know those places. Um, people are tuning in. They're hearing and seeing this title. Yana's talking about international expansion problems. 
problems seem to come with international expansion almost all all the time and uh people people don't hear about the good things or we try to talk about the good things but there's always the problem side and i feel like people are hitting their head against the proverbial wall all the time and they just give up they're they're just like ah, this is not worth it it's it's not something that i want to have to deal with i'd rather focus on my sales in the u.s or these other markets or try shopify or try walmart.com i'd rather do that than go to another market that might have the exact same customer type as me it's just a different localized you know audience or community if you will i mean you just have to do the same work or you kind of uh, customize it to them instead why does it seem more of like a hassle than uh than uh you know an opportunity for you well, that's a really good question. And I think that uh, sellers did not think about this a lot before they actually decide to expand or like whatever. I think uh, it's like a lot of hassle for them because nobody does any market research to begin with. And nobody does, doesn't do any due diligence uh, to begin Maybe with. Maybe one line uh, of data well. and then that's it. That, they're like, Literally oh. like, oh, good, we're good to go. Let's do it. And then there are like so many pain points and there's just like so many bottlenecks along that road. And just people think like, oh, wow, well, this competitor is making so much money. Let's do it. Like, it's obviously a good opportunity for us as well. But nobody cares about due diligence, p &L. Like, they just don't have like a proper business. Um, no, no case studies, actual case studies that none of the team members went through. So there are like so many things that are overseen and just think it's, it's still that like get rich quickly, you know, scheme and, you know, like saying if this competitor can do it, I can do it better. Just like going and doing that. And it takes a lot of things for you to get ready and to decide which marketplace to go on next and like, you know, how to do it properly and all of that. Um, so they blow a lot of money and uh, they never do it the right way. Um, and we've seen that happen all the time. It happens to very big brands, small private label sellers, all of them make the same mistakes over and over again. And that always amazes me, you know, like how you can do a fantastic job in the U.S. market and then you just fail miserably in all other global marketplaces. But I would say that mostly, like I would say an 80% that relies on lack of due diligence and lack of awareness, um, knowing that new marketplace, the audience, you know, maybe like VAT shippings are going to be different. You know, like um, I know that, you know, like um, after Brexit, like, you know, all the sellers, they want to expand from the UK to Europe are having problems like shipping uh, products like to um, to Europe or maybe if you were a US seller and you were selling only in the UK and this is where your warehouse is also problems going to to Europe. But now, like, for instance, like what people do is like it's quicker to get VAT in, in the Netherlands, uh, which is kind of a big thing for the national sellers. And then they could ship the product directly to the Netherlands and then it can save time on like um, having them shipped to Germany, um, they have it shipped to the Netherlands as well. You know, if you have like IOR partners to help up with importing the product, this has all like, you know, this can all help you and speed things up a lot, but people don't think about that that way. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of US sellers don't, are, are not even aware of this problem. How long is it going to take them to get their UK products to Germany? And whereas they can like apply for VAT in the Netherlands, get that registered, and from there you can ship it out like throughout the whole Europe instead of like waiting for VATs for a longer time or whatever. But this is all something you can, you know, find out if you do due diligence. It's not like a public secret, but a lot of sellers tell me that they have never heard about this or they don't know about this just because they did not put a lot of time and effort into this as they thought it was irrelevant, you know, and right. they're like so many things like that. Yeah, they're like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll check out UK or something. Yeah, we'll like that. we'll figure they, it out. It's we'll, fine. Yeah, we'll yeah. like we'll probably do that next month or something. When in all reality, they have no idea the the time frame, right? The timeline of it takes of getting active and up and running and actually being compliant within that country completely different um, than what it is to the United States. It's not that I, I just think like the preparation beforehand and the expe setting expectations. It's not done with many different companies, and now you you guys do that. Is is that is that something you encounter quite a bit? Of hey, we were thinking about um, you know starting in Germany um, next month, and you're like, that's not possible. Is is that feel like it comes up often, or what? What's the biggest uh, question that people ask you, and you just kind of laugh because it's consistent, and you're giving the same thing over and over again. Well, usually people are just like, hey, so should I do like one product? 
And if this one product goes well, I'm going to do all 45 of them on all the product marketplaces. <laughs> From I one to 45. Product. Literally, with like one sample, maybe you see that this, like we're going to be so super careful with this one. And then if it works, it's due to like, like 50 aces on seven marketplaces. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so sure. we, we get this a lot, which is, I mean, hey, it's great for our business. But then, like, sometimes I'm like, are you sure you're going to roll out? Like, are you going to do like batches, but just going to like roll out everything you have? So that's also not great either. Like, to be kind of over careful and then to be just like, oh, okay, it's all going to work. Let's go. <laughs> you know, let's just do it. Um, yeah. It's going to take like, you know, a lot of time, a lot of money. So this is like something that we come across very often. The second thing when it comes to content is, of course, um, machine translations, Amazon uh, machine translation service that really does not good, do a good job. Um, sometimes it does make sense, but it rarely does. But what's most important is that it doesn't have any keywords embedded in this listing. So nobody's going to be able to find the, this, this listing. Yes, you're going you're gonna to run PPC, but maybe you didn't even know what type of keywords you have there because it's a foreign language. So that's, that's a problem. And people just kind of rolling out with the machine translations and all of that. Uh, and that's like really a big problem. Also like in the States, what is really, um, I would say what is kind of convenient is that like this listing, you can like um, change like the A plus content. We can change it and like um, switch the A plus to be like in Spanish. But the problem is that the Amazon auto translates this listing to Spanish. I think now it can auto translate the whole one. So you need to prevent this from happening and you need to upload your own translation, which is cool because like literally it can be bilingual while you're still like on Amazon.com, not the Mexican one. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to reach out to the, uh, you need to reach out to Amazon. You cannot upload it, this translation manually. And I've recently had a question about that, which I, I think it's kind of rele relevant for, for me now to, uh, touch on because also it's something that I think people um, you know they, they they are wondering about that a lot uh, when you have something like that you should not leave it as it is because it's a machine translation again it will not make a lot of sense it would not have all those great Spanish keywords in backends or anywhere where you want to have them um, and it will not pop up for those search terms uh, but you would need to reach out to Amazon there's no other way to do it in order to um, um, upload your own manual, you need to reach out to the Amazon contribution team and then they will connect you and, and you should ask them uh, to be connected to, with the Amazon translation team. Mm. And then you give them the, the translations and then they can be manually uploaded. So this is something that people don't understand how to do, but unfortunately this time um, for now, it's contribution team and then ask them to connect you with the translations team and this is how you get this manually uploaded with all the okay. keywords and everything you want to have in this text. For clarification, this is not someone who's Spanish speaking as on .com and they have Google translate it for them in their browser, correct? This is as if they're going to .com, going into the top right corner, I believe, and then if they click on the the flag or the icon yes, or exactly. the language yeah. and they click down to Spanish, that would be where you would get that translation uploaded. Yes, exactly. Manually. It's on... It's on US Amazon, but uh, it does have an opportunity to, to read it in Spanish as well, but it can do a lot of harm. So I always suggest mm. that it's, it's, it's going to be, it's not going to be a quick process, but it, it could potentially be very profitable for you to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's something that people don't know. And often I have questions about this and I don't know how many of them, um, you know, are persistent with getting in touch with the contribution team because they don't know who to contact. But your point of contact should be asking for the contribution team and then asking the contrib contribution team for translations team. This is how it works. That's a good point. And that's something that's intriguing to me recently is when um, I think the first person I heard talking about this that really started to get the gears going was Vanessa Hung. She talked about mm -hmm. yeah. hey, Spanish speaking people searching in .com and making sure that you're relevant within Spanish searches within .com. And so I started thinking about the more of how cultures cross poll, you know, I say cross pollinate, they, they, they move and they're going within that country of origin. So whether it be uh, Latin America moving to the United States or United States moving to, you know, Europe, you see a lot of people moving around this time of year, but um, people are transplants in different parts of the world and they will search differently based upon what they're used to, but also their language. What, what for, for our sellers out there or for people who are listening to this, What's the most common place that you have to always remind people, hey, remember, think about this blank X uh, speaker 
who, mm -hmm. um, who's in this audience, um, because you're going to be missing out on quite a bit of searches um, within yeah. this ecosystem if you don't. So in the U.S., that is definitely Spanish as because of the majority of the Hispanic population located okay. there. Um, but also like in Europe, I mean, you're not going to have that like that quantity of population of any other minorities as you have Hispanic in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of time there. There'll be a lot of times you get get like keyword results. And then a lot of times you'll be just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm doing the, 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 the keyword research uh, in Germany. And you're like, okay, I'm going to do keyword research in Germany and I expect to see like only uh, German keywords. Uh, some of these keywords will not be in German and you'll probably be like, mm, what is this? Is this just like some gibberish, like, you know, right. version of German or whatever it is. Uh, but it, it's highly likely going to be Turkish or some other, like maybe like even a Balkan language because we did... Um, a it's like, it was like a kitchenware product with something to like make like a your own like homemade kebab or something like that and those are like those skewers but they're like specially yep. made for kebabs um they're not regular skewers I'm, i don't know what's the difference between regular skewers and, and these but these were like kebab only and um and then also like in the search results you got like a lot of turkish words uh, and none of the competitors were, had that in any of the backends or anywhere else. Of course, you're going to put it in backends, not in front end, because it's going to be weird. But in backends, none of the competitors had that. And they had decent search volume. So they had like 700 search volume, which is pretty high if you don't have anybody else. <laughs> There's a fly. Uh, ranking for these. Um, and uh, this is these are like some potential sales. So my advice is that you should go like through your keyword list and see like if maybe there's something that doesn't sound German, doesn't sound right. Maybe double check it if there's like a really like a different language and there's like a population that searches for this product in their own language on Amazon, on Amazon.de or other marketplaces. And then if you see that it has a bigger search volume than 100 or 200, then put that in, in the back ends because that is going to be some valuable keyword and gold nugget that everybody else is missing out on. And we do see this with some products that, that, that doesn't happen all the time, but with some products, like for instance, like the, 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 the kitchen, the, the skewer kebab, uh, this is what we've seen. And we put all these Turkish words in back ends uh, and that was really great for that seller. So, um, you know, don't underestimate the power of, other nationalities in that country where you're selling. Absolutely. I mean, that's a fantastic tip. Has there been something that surprised you enough where I, I, I'm trying to think of a specific, you know, example, how, how it's either surprised you about the tone in which somebody will search or how, how often does tone and how somebody says something, whether it be, you know, here in America, we we seem to use a lot of adjectives. We use a lot of filler words to describe mm -hmm. fluffy or you know soft yeah. or I mean, there's so many different variables. But when you go to a different localized you know country or marketplace, the tone is completely different. How often is that considered or not even considered when it comes to how people are searching for things? Mm, so I would say that I mean, people search for things with keywords. And uh, keywords are, it's very like dry, you know, like you get a keyword, you do search volumes, all of that, but the content and the listing is what resonates with the audience. And then a lot of US brands have this like salesly fluffy style, like emotionally talking about this product, like trying to have like the, the quick hooks, you know, they're very mm -hmm. like uh, impulsive buyers and all of that. Like, you know, um, I real content, I'm like, shut up and take my money. I'm that person, you know? Um, but uh, in Germany, it doesn't do so well. You know, like it sounds very weird to just have that same approach to the German audience and to be very like fluffy in that whole, like, you know, I'm going to make you buy this product thing mm -hmm. where Germans really want to hear about the features of the product and the benefits. How will this help me solve the product? And I will be the judge of if I like this product or not. But like in the States, you'll be just like, you're going to love this product. And Germans are like, don't tell me that I'm going to love this product. Don't tell me what to do. I'll be the one that will be judge of that, you know? So this is like a very big difference between like the content style when it comes to US and, and German. And most, most countries in Europe are going to be, I, I'm not going to say like exactly like Germany, but less like the, the, the style in the States. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, absolutely mandatory is to do the keyword research for each marketplace separately, because even if you compare UK and US, you're not going to have 
uh, the same keywords all the time. Also, there's like, you know, um, uh, localization where it's like, I don't know, like you have diapers in the States and you have nappies in the UK and, you know, just like so many different things. But even like, um, if we just kind of think about like different states within the U S uh, where you have the, you have the book bag, uh, you have the book bag and then you have the, um, what's it called? Um, backpack. Yeah. You have the backpack mm-hmm. in New York and you have the book bag in Pennsylvania, you know? So like, and it's all the same country. It's all the same language, but it's, there are differences. So just like think of different countries having, uh, speaking different languages, how, th- how, uh, different that is you know and cultures right. and you know and people will not search for same things like uh wooden toys are very popular in europe and they do crazy well in sales but they don't do as well in in the states and it's also about like the the culture of the country like the way uh the people grew up like when i was a kid i used to play with wooden toys and mm-hmm. my parents as well but like in the u.s it's kind of more like plastic oriented and like the plastic toys and it's just different. It's just different mentality, different cultures, different ways of growing up. It all affects the sales and the search terms that that um, consumers are interested in as well. Well, I'm going to take it a step further. What about a, a brand tone, like a voice? Um, how how does that? If I'm you were you were talking a bit a little bit about hey, shut up, take my money. That that's a story that a consumer or like a consumer wants to be told. But you as an entrepreneur, you're trying to portray this. Hey, I um, I might have had this health issue, and then I developed like this soap to help me and overcome my like problems. Mm-hmm. A brand voice ha- ha- it speaks to why I'm there, who I am as a person. How does that message resonate differently with different cultures around the world? Or when I'm expanding, does that matter as much in more places, or it doesn't matter at all? And they're like, mm-hmm. I could care less what your problems are. Does my product work? Yes, no. Like you yeah. said with the German. Um, that, that doesn't translate well. Do, does that come into thought uh, when yeah. people are expanding? So that never comes to thought. Like, absolutely not. Uh, I think that's like literally something that maybe less than 5% brands think about uh, because this is a very valid uh, point. Bec- you know, um, a lot of times you're going to have this logo or motto or, you know, my product helps you, you know, you know, solve this or that mm-hmm. and then it just sounds weird in, in germany or maybe just like wow are they even allowed to say that you know like, just like talking about the regulatory system health claims all of that you know like a, you're not allowed in germany you're not allowed to use the word probiotics but you are allowed to use it on all the other marketplaces in europe mm. right so there are so many details you have to pay attention to but also like if you want to convey the same message of your brand you really kind of have to be careful. And this is where I like to mention the, the one of the best localization uh, examples ever made in, in history. And that is when Coca-Cola had that campaign, like share the Coke with, mm-hmm. you know, Bill, Je- you know, Job, Rosh, whoever. Uh, and then um, they kind of had that localized into all different names across the whole world. You know, it was like Jose and Miguel in Mexico. And then it was... Christopher, it was, uh, I don't know, Hans, and like, like Sweden, in Germany, Nordic, yeah. Sweden, all that. So everybody had their like own localized name. So it doesn't sound weird. Like I'm, I'm like here in Serbia, I don't have a name, friend named Jason. <laughs> he, he's not going to relate to that. It exist so what they, <laughs> yeah. So basically uh, I would say that 90% of the world was totally okay with that, except China, for instance, because in China, it's very sensitive to call someone by their first name. Right. So, uh, and it was, it's yeah. usual to kind of use like the last names or Mr. Mrs. But it was kind of like, it didn't sit well with, you know, with this campaign. So what they did instead is that they, 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 they wrote share a Coke with friend or teacher or sister or mother or, you know, and they kind of replace this whole localization like the first name thing into like oh well i'm a teacher i can buy this coke and i can identify with that and here's something for my mom or for my brother or for my mechanic or you know so and people love that and that campaign was also like one of the most successful ones um that the coke ever launched in every single country it made exactly the, the 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 same it connected with the audience the same way as it did in all the other countries and they avoided all of that negative feedback and maybe like a backlash because of this and that 
So that was very, very well thought through. And uh, this is also what brands should think when they also want to, you know, convey the same message and like the bring that motto translated for the other audience, uh, because that maybe has to be changed drastically um, for certain countries. And also when it comes to images as well, you know, like brands ask me like about the images and then they just... Uh, translate the text on the images and this is how they localize for a new marketplace and from all of the brands that we've ever worked with and we do about two to four thousand products every single month uh, not a single brand has ever changed their main images for a different marketplace they always have the same images across all global marketplaces but they have now different texts like translated on these images. Even though sometimes I say like, mm, well, maybe you want to kind of make this image kind of more international or, you know, like yeah. this kind of looks very like, for instance, like, you know, um, you have door handles and also mm -hmm. bathrooms, for instance. So bathrooms in the US, they look different than they look in Europe. So if you have like somebody like, you know, like I'm just like brushing my teeth in my bathroom. And then in this like bathtub has the sh head, um, shower head, it's stuck to the ceiling, literally. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the hose where you can just use it and like wash yep. yourself like you do in Europe. So this image is pretty much like, you know, it's like, it's the States. Like, you know, right. it's it over there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then if I'm like maybe in Italy, I'll be just like, oh, this is like a US image. Like maybe I kind of feel like this is like something like very far away and like that does not connect with me as like, this is something I want to have in my home because maybe I don't like these U.S. bathrooms. Like, I don't want to have well, anything that reminds me of these, like, U.S. bathrooms, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, like, just the size of, like, a shower, for example. Uh, I know in Italy, <laughs> I barely, yeah, exactly. just one person can sit and you can just rotate in there. Yeah, and here it's in the very States, different. Like five people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So we had a lot of products that were, like, that were, like accessories for your shower cabin that literally would not... Of course, you can put it in your, let's say, European shower shower cabin or on your bathtub, but it it will be different than if you were to put it in a, a bathtub or in like a shower cabin in the U.S. And you would have U.S. pictures, and they will not look the same as it does in Europe. So people don't think about that at all. You know, absolutely. So that's I... that's the problem. There are like a lot of product products like that that you, you would need to redo your images. But nobody has ever done it. I, I was talking. Um, th this was a year and a half ago, maybe two years now. Um, he was a professor of localization here in the United States, mm -hmm. and I happened to be introduced to him just just through you know friends and uh, online. And when I asked him, I said, "Your job is to consult for corporate America, top five hundred, you know, companies in the world." Outside of Amazon, let's talk about localization in terms of like uh, of just any company out there who does the best mm -hmm. job. And he said something that shocked me. And until this day, I still think it's one of the best examples. He said the best Fortune 500 company uh, out there, and it's it's globally known, is IKEA. And I thought about that, and I went online, and I still did just now to this day. So if you're watching this live, uh, I don't have an example, but I went to IKEA, and they and they have broken down per region. And then they do also per translation per region. So even if I'm here in the United States, I can do um, I can do IKEA.ca, which is French. I can do IKEA.mx, which is in Spanish, or MX in English. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can do all those different things, and they break it down per region, per country. And uh, every website actually changes both dynamically with images, but also how mm -hmm. the layout of your website is. So again, again if you're reading right to left or left to right or top to bottom or whatever however that goes however that feeling is and then also it does because it's um you know localized it does different um uh holidays based upon where that yeah. country is and then it, it just does yeah. it, this step further that not many people think of but mm -hmm. this kind of this com this company when you think of here it's like uh, it's like cheap furniture or whatever it is but they're yeah. speaking globally and their products translate so differently because of like what the family looks like in that home right it's like what does dinner time look exactly. like who's cooking dinner exactly. who's not does that person work is it a big family is it a small family all these things come to mind and i've never absolutely about those it. are some valid points and exactly like you said like you know um in japan there's like they all they all have like one child versus like in the states or like mexico or anywhere else where there's like 
three to six kids, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not something that people in Japan can relate with. And, you know, but it's really funny that you've mentioned IKEA. I wanted to say that when it comes to their localization, they're also great. I also um, noticed that, you know, different holidays and uh, pictures, especially with families and what they like the candles, not even existing candles in some countries. But what's very interesting for them is that they kind of kept their own, like, uh, um, original stamp which is the name of the products which are mm-hmm. always in Swedish so you have a model called uh, Lisa which is like a candle Lisa Tvo and it's Lisa Tvo in all of these countries and then you don't even have to understand how to read Swedish but that model name is going to be the same in absolutely all countries around the world which I really like because that kind of what makes them unique so it's like their way of like standing out and having it like in Swedish while they localize absolutely everything. And I think that mm. that's just brilliant. It's, it's fantastic. And I, I go to that for inspiration too, because, you know, just to kind of poke my head into another culture, a lot of people think about this, Hey, in the United States, it, it's great. We spend a lot of money. We buy a lot of products, but if you're poking yeah. and you're trying to build a global brand, global brand means speaking to, uh, masses amounts of people and you speak to them intelligently. And again, you, you speak to them, almost as if they are the ones that you are speaking to, like one-on-one, if you're in that room, again, it doesn't it doesn't happen always with every single brand. And people call BS on it because here in the United States, oh, that's a Chinese-based product. How do I know that? I do that because I look at how it speaks to me, but we don't translate that to the selling aspect. We don't flip it on the other end and we say, hey, how are people going to perceive this in another part of the world? It just doesn't happen, and it's really disjointed, and it's confusing why people don't always translate that to when they're trying to build to another segment, different market, a different culture. It doesn't always make sense because you are not the customer in this instance. Other people are, and we just don't we just don't consider that as much. And I and I hate no. that there's not that consideration for as many brands out there that are trying to expand globally. Um, for the, for the couple more minutes that I have with you, Yana, um, I'm curious. You've been traveling around a lot, and, I, and I'm always curious. I know you're taking a break from it. What's kind of the thing that's popping up that people are consistently talking about from sellers around Europe? Um, you've, you've taken some trips. I think you were in uh, APAC region for, for what, Bali or something like that as well. Um, what have you noticed around the world that, that sellers are, are talking about or they're noticing? And um, what can you share with us in that aspect? So yeah, I've seen a lot of Bali, that's for sure. Uh, I've <laughs> Not seen for a business, lot of, but hey. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of Bali, yeah. Uh, a lot of different masterminds um, uh, across the world and also a lot of different sourcing trips. That's what I've seen lately. Um, I've seen, so usually it was like, you know, um, China sourcing trip. But mm-hmm. like ever since um, COVID happened, I think people have been looking for different solutions for their sourcing. Um, so I've seen sourcing trips like go to Mexico, mm-hmm. even uh, Jordan, um, uh, what it was it, Taiwan, India. Yeah. Uh, India. There were like so many different sourcing trips happening uh, as well. Um, and I've just seen that uh, people have been traveling now more than ever and people just gonna everywhere like social butterflies. Uh, but also like what I've seen is that um, uh, people now also want to kind of pull the plug on like just kind of be, being overly exposed to all of these events. I think that now it, the problem is that um, sellers don't want to go to a lot of these events because they're going to be like service providers like grabbing them. So I think that uh, sellers kind of really kind of want to focus more on the masterminds than like on regular events, even like smaller ones, but with, with like higher value for them. Because mm-hmm. now it's also all about like sharing actually who does what and how does this help my business or doesn't help my business without being very salesy, which I think mm-hmm. now kind of sellers are like kind of fed up with. This is like what I've, what I've noticed uh, traveling around, going to all the different events and masterminds. Yeah. No one likes to be sold to. And this is coming from, from two service providers who uh, stay. Yeah. I don't want to be, I, I don't want to people, but honestly, like I don't want to talk to someone. And I don't want to like, I don't want to like talk to someone for two minutes because, Oh, here comes the sales pitch. You know, like sometimes you just kind of want to go and like 
make brands have a drink and then we don't have to like be like it doesn't have to be a business heavy conversation mm-hmm. but you don't know like what's going to come out of it in like next six or seven months so yeah. i just think that you know like people like to enjoy themselves and like share some value and have a good time instead of like just waiting for the sales pitch to happen to me and to you as well you know yeah. uh, it's not only sellers who are affected i think it's everyone space really yeah i i think i think the most valuable relationships i've built in this space especially with sellers is i they, they've asked me just a simple question and i've gone around and i've kind of asked for them and and solved it just because of my, yeah. my network of people and same with you uh and that and that's come back in tenfold of hey they had a problem they're asking hey do you notice these kind of things yeah i sat and see we had some clients this is the reasoning exactly. why like no problem like don't yeah i don't i'm not charging for <laughs> for my my uh, no, observations like, or my yeah. knowledge or anything like that. That's silly. Same. I think really, I think we're also like uh, sellers really appreciate that. And I think that if you give uh, good value to someone or you connect them with someone who can solve their problem, if I can't like um, people really appreciate that because you took your time to help someone, you know, like I'd rather help someone if I can't have the solution, I'd rather send them uh, the way that he can get help and then people will appreciate that and they will remember you uh more frequently than as if they're like paid like 150 euros to you to kind of get some sort of information and i really also like that as well because that also kind of builds um long-term relationships and it kind of gets you like on a more serious level of a relationship with anyone because they see that you kind of care to to solve their problem because maybe tomorrow I will need something like that. And I would definitely appreciate if someone can give me a solution or connect me with someone who would be able to help me versus earning a couple of hundred of extra bucks or yeah, you know, a couple hundreds of bucks. You know, I'm, not, really. I'm not here to earn a commission from uh, any sort no. of sales. My job, no. is, uh, my job is to educate and also help the people grow. And that's, that's the life exactly. I wasn't in this space. But uh, hey, I know we're already close on time. For, for kind of coming up, uh, we've kind of noticed this. Um, and we, we've touched on a little bit. Prime Day was actually announced. I'll say breaking news. It's still breaking news. Uh, last week, it was yeah. uh, for anyone who's watching this or listening to this, break, uh, Prime Day was announced on July 11th and 12th this year. The worst kept secret in e-commerce, as I always <laughs> say, is just which days is it going to be on the second week of July. Um, yeah. And it's 11th and 12th. Um, this is the ninth time that prime day has happened believe it or not it's almost it's already wow. uh, nine years that prime days happened um Man. i looked at the statistics on their website it now is celebrated in over 20 plus countries around the world at the same time so my tip or do you have any tips for people who are listening to this uh before prime day a- any any insights on what you guys are advising clients to do is this a good time to expand is this a good time to to check in your listings or optimize things. What, what, what are those things you're, you're off offering yeah, for, I any think, for people? I think it's definitely too late to start expanding now. So if you already haven't expanded, but you have time for the second prime day, which is going to be in autumn. So maybe you can start getting ready for that second prime day and expand for that. But for this prime day, like kind of sort of like a short, like checklist, what you should do now. So we have about, three weeks before prime day is like check your images. They have fantastic images and check your keywords. This is still something that you can check right now. Make sure you're ranking for all the relevant keywords. Do not change a lot of things. If you've been doing things a certain way and they've been working, do not have last minute changes. This is not a good idea. Um, uh, Either like PPC or content wise, do not change it, but just make sure that you do have good keywords. And if you do not have good, good keywords now, learn from your mistakes and then change it and get ready for the next prime day, which is going to be in autumn. Uh, Same goes for, for those images, but definitely lots of AB testing. Now we've been hearing that a plus content also now gets indexed. So make sure and main images as well. So make sure that um, it hasn't been 100% confirmed, but we've heard a lot of sellers tell us this after we've done the content. So make sure to put a couple of keywords on your main images and a plus content, and then track that and see if they're gonna convert or not. But I would definitely um, put those um, over there as I'm, I'm, I think that um, the algo now kind of scans that through as well. Mm-hmm. Are you are you helping people with any sort of off Amazon content to drive them to listings or like for example, like thought pieces or 
something where they can send out to their email list or anything of that sort? Is yeah. That- happening absolutely like if you have any like um uh, follow-up emails or, or like um shopify store or sure. uh basically manuals anything else anything that has content on it you want some storytelling whatever we handle that as well either like on copywriting or translations for all global marketplaces absolutely very cool love the tips um and we like to say it too it's not too late to send an inventory with small parcel that's that's the last thing you can yeah. possibly do leading up to Prime Day. That's that's all the tip of advice. And then also just keep people engaged afterwards. Just monitor very closely and, and see what's working, like you said, and kind of prep for the next one. There's always another event or holiday or something like that we're arbitrarily creating for, for ourselves in, in this space. But yeah. if people are, um, for Yana, for people are um, curious and want to learn more um, about YLT, you, you guys have some cool announcements that I'm sure are coming up with your new portal uh, services that you guys are expanding on, how do they get in touch with you or reach out and ask you questions? Yeah. So I'm always happy to talk about international expansion, whatever. I'm really, really passionate about that in case you couldn't tell this exciting interview. Why you're here. Um, I, I'm really active on LinkedIn. I should probably post even more, but I really do put out some good content. It's always like up to date with the latest things. Uh, something I reference me. you. I reference you in my presentations. <laughs> I hope you know that in my Amazon presentation, I had your uh, really? of LinkedIn. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, I really try to do a bunch of analysis of like, you know, what brands are doing wrong, what are doing right, what, what, what they should do better. Um, we should probably more do, do more of those videos. People love it, but I just really can't. I hate recording myself, but I should kind of, you know, get on top of that and do it more. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'd say LinkedIn is the best way to reach, uh, reach out to me personally. But definitely, like, if you want to get like a feedback on your listings that are underperforming uh, or, you know, maybe if you're wondering if they could do any better, um, you're welcome to fill out contact form on our website, wild-translations.com. And also if you have, maybe if you're wondering what marketplace, what country you could sell it next, we also do this manual report that kind of helps you be basically do a little due diligence for you that, you know, like a lot of sellers don't do. Uh, so we help with that as well. And then if you have any inquiries about that, you can also reach out to me or to my team on the website. We're happy to um, offer a bunch of advice, just hop on a call, talk about your brand, anything that can make you uh, make more sales on a new marketplace. Yeah, I love it. Oh, you're always uh, one of the person who top of mind. If I don't know a question or an answer answer to a question, uh, I always uh, think of you or want to make sure I get people over to you. So thank you so thank much you. for all you've done in the space and helping people expand globally. Uh, for all of us in that space, uh, we all we all work together really nicely. So it's it's yeah. always nice to talk in and keep learning from individuals like you. So uh, thanks for hopping on the Global Spin podcast and sharing some wisdom today. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's been my no pleasure. Problem. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Yana. And thank you, everyone, for taking a couple minutes of your day to learn about international expansion problems and, and just the, the insights that we have. Uh, again, this is this is not sell, selling anything. This is something just sharing free information for people who are looking to help uh, grow their business to, and take it to the next level. Hopefully, you, you liked it. Uh, if you're watching this, make sure you uh, hit that like button or share it with a colleague or your team who who might uh, ask the same question and you happen to and get that insight and you want to share it with your team or if you could just share it with your network, that'd be fantastic as well. But my name is Ryan Kramer. I'm the host of the Global Spin Podcast. And of course, everything here is brought to you and fueled by Frisbee, helping brands expand globally uh, with uh, shipping, logistics, and Porter record and other services um, as well. Just check out frisbee.com. Um, otherwise we'll catch you guys next time on another episode. If you haven't already subscribe to our channels and make sure that you, uh, follow along for other upcoming insightful episodes that are unscripted and, uh, fun to listen to, but we'll catch you guys next time on another episode of the global spin podcast. Take care. (laughs) 